tous, mon nom est Elisabeth Vallet, je suis directrice de l'Observatoire de géopolitique de la chaire Raoul Dandurand. Bienvenue à bord. <rire> euh, J'ai le grand plaisir aujourd'hui de vous présenter notre conférencier qui nous parlera de la relation entre la, la Russie et la Finlande, notamment dans ses aspects euh, frontaliers. Um, as the saying says, English will follow. Um, Dr. Leine is Professor of Multidisciplinary Border Studies at the Karolin Institute of the University of Eastern Finland, and he, he is the President of the World Social Science Association. Um, currently serves on the steering committee of the um, International Geographical Union's uh, Commission on Political Geography. He is one of the leading scholars um, in border studies in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I can say already now familiar faces on the audience. It's very good to, good to be here. Uh, leading scholar is pushing it though. It's, uh, on the introduction, it was a little bit too much, but it's, it's still nice to be uh, recognized uh, on, on this field. Very happy to be here. Thanks for coming to, to listen uh, to me. Uh, and thanks for the invitation to, to come and talk to you. The, the topic that I'm going to discuss is, is, is quite, quite topical, happening right now uh, as we speak. Just a couple of hours ago, the Finnish government made the decision, official decision to close several of the border crossing points uh, at the Finnish-Russian border uh, as a response to the uh, recent influx of refugee arrivals to, uh, uh, from Russia to Finland. Uh, quite astonishing uh, decision in my mind, uh, basically deviation from the international agreements that have been very important for our government for a long time, and now when uh, a very small number of people arrived to the border, uh, 92 uh, by, uh, by the recent count, uh, that caused this very abrupt decision. But let me backtrack about uh, 800 years uh, to give you a, a little bit of a background uh, very briefly. I'm not a historian and I'm not going to give you a history lecture on this. But in order to really understand uh, what's happening today, a bit of a, a background is uh, needed in, in, in my, my view. The, the border is a very uh, interesting one in, in the sense that the significance, the role that the border has played has been changing a number of times through history, throughout history, uh, uh, reflecting the broader political and, and social changes. Uh, and also the, the, the very administrative units that the border uh, is encapsulating inside have changed. I'm going to show this a little bit. Generally, if we think about the last 30 years, the, the era since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the border has been really uh, marked by openness, paradiplomatic relations, strong cross-border cooperation, often heralded as one of the very good examples how two countries who otherwise don't really get along in a, in a political sense or do not think alike may still have meaningful local level cross-border cooperation. And this has often been highlighted as a success story. Uh, Finland as a bridge connecting Europe and, and Russia. This has very much now come to an end and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain why uh, that is, why we have arrived to the moment uh, what is going on uh, today. Now, Let's start from this, uh, because this brings an, an interesting nuance to the argument. The, the border that you see here, we are still pretty much talking about the same border, the, the one on the, on the eastern side here, even though at the time that the border was first drawn, uh, a country called Finland or any kind of unity called Finland did not exist. So back then, uh, when the borders were drawn first between the Kingdom of Sweden and, the, and, and Nov Novgorod, the medieval Russian Empire, Finland was nothing but an eastern province of Sweden. Uh, this is quite important uh, to, to, uh, to understand. The border was redrawn multiple times. It went back and forth based on, on, the, uh, on the changing balance of power between these two empires. By the 18th century, 
uh, the Russian Empire start to gain supremacy over Sweden and eventually led to the situation where Finland lost or gave up, to be more precise, the province of Finland uh, to, uh, to Russian Empire in 1809. And why this is meaningful in the sense that this was the first time when Finland, even though being under the Russian rule, formed an autonomous grand duchy and administrative unit of its own. And this is when the uh, customs border that we see here for the first time uh, was, was created. Jumping onwards, I go really quickly to this history so we, we get to what is going on today. Uh, the, the era of independence, 1917, uh, marked a, a very strong hostile military border between Finland and Soviet Union at, at that time. The border was practically closed for 70 years uh, and, and heavily militarized. There was no uh, easy access for common people to cross the border in, in either, of the uh, either directions. In order to cross that from Finland, you had to be a part of some kind of official delegation uh, supported by the government to get the visa. And, and you, you, you could uh, visit the other side, but it, uh, the, your, your visit was strictly controlled and, and orchestrated. Uh, the border, uh, as you see here, uh, this is from uh, right after the independence. Uh, 1917. If you know how Finland looks like at the moment, it doesn't really look like that. There are parts of missing uh, from this this lower lower uh, southeastern corner, which was the uh, the solution after the two wars uh, that was fought between Finland and Soviet Union during the Second World War, the so-called Winter War and the Continuation War. But this is where the interesting uh, period uh, really started, because uh, the, even though Finland gained or remained independence after, after the Winter War, the relations were very much controlled by the Soviet Union. Uh, the Finnish government was forced to sign an agreement uh, and also forced to be neutral, with, uh, not to join any Western uh, associations uh, which existed uh, at the time. And all cross-border linkages were also very much uh, um, uh, dictated by the governmental agreements. That kind of daily day people-to-people uh, -people interaction that we now see at many borders did not exist whatsoever. So for common people, the border still very much uh, used to be, uh, used to be uh, closed. Now, moving on again, uh, uh, Soviet Union collapsed, which was a very meaningful in the sense that when the Soviet Union collapsed, also all those quite biased agreements that Finland had signed with the Soviet Union ceased to exist because the contractor party on the other side was no longer there. And this really marked the, a moment of openness where we can see that the border started to open. By that time, during this closure that I mentioned already that the border had been closed for 70 years, the two sides had been developing in quite different directions. Right? Uh, the Russian side had a very communist system in place at the time. Finland chose to take more capitalist approach and develop to that direction. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, the two sides had been developed to such a different direction that the socio-economic gap at the border was the highest in the whole world in 1990. Right? So, the border did not only mark a political distinction, it also marked, of course, a cultural and a religious one. It was also a border between Western and Eastern Christianity. But the economic, socio-economic gap was absolutely huge. And you know, if you study borders, that when there's a major uh, uh, socio-economic gap at the border, it fuels certain type of interaction. If the other side is remarkably wealthier than, than the other side. So a lot of interest was put to try to normalize this, this border, right? Uh, the Finnish approach was to remain neutral, even though it was no longer forced because the agreements were not in place. But still we were in the situation that we were the smaller neighbor living very close to a, a giant uh, at that time, right? Uh, so the, the approach was not to join any military alliances, such as NATO, and we get there uh, in 15 minutes, uh, but to remain neutral. 
right? And try to manage the relations by using a lot more softer power, by, by trying to, to collaborate with the Russian side, create these people-to-people -people linkages. A lot of money were put into assistance on the other side uh, with the assumption that you know, if we force, uh, if we create these local and regional level linkages, those will alleviate any risk of conflict or risk in the future because we are so interlinked and, and know the other side better. This was very much the moment, uh, momentum as well when Finland then joined the European Union quite soon after. Finland applied the membership to the European Union two weeks after the Soviet Union collapsed, when the agreement uh, that had dictated the relations ceased to exist. When Finland then joined the European Union in 1995, Finland tried to market itself within the European policy frame as a, some kind of a Russian expert, a link a bridge, if you will, between European Union and, and Russia. Not just in the geographical sense, but being a new member in the European Union, a small country, Finland well, felt rather uh, peripheral in the European politics, far away from Brussels, uh, or far away from France and Germany, uh, and UK at that time, where the decisions uh, were made. So Finland really started to market itself also as a, as a Russian expert for the European Union. And it worked really well for a long time. It was really beneficial also for Finland because this part of the country, the eastern part of the, the country facing Russia, it, uh, is by far the poorest part of the country. It had always been that buffer zone that if something goes wrong, that's going to be the area that will first feel the pressure on the Russian side. So a lot of European funding became available for Eastern Finland. Not because Brussels would have cared really what happened in Eastern Finland, but it was very much supporting the European policies to try to bring Russia closer to the European Union. A lot of funding became available for various kinds of cross-border cooperation initiatives at the local and regional level with a strong political support. So we are now talking about late 1990s, early uh, 2000 uh, era. The border proximity, which had for decades, if not centuries, always been considered as a challenge or hindrance or a problem, was now seen as an asset. That it is a beneficial for us to open the border, try to interact with the other side. And it's important to note here uh, that, for example, the city of, do I have a pointer here? The city of St. Petersburg, which is right here, has a population of just under 9 million people, maybe, maybe more at the moment. The country of Finland as a whole has 5 million people, right? So it was seen that this eastern part of the country right here, it was foolish not to have closer linkages, especially economic linkages to this. It was a huge market area for Finnish businesses, um, which otherwise was, were kind of stuck in, in that corner when the border was, was closed. Without Russia, much of Finland looks like an island in geographical terms. The connections to other areas are quite, uh, quite poor, unless you, you then go all the way to, to Lapland. Uh, that would be a different case. So strong effort was, was, was put on these relations. Russia provided a lot of opportunities, huge markets, and also the other way. A lot of Russians started to come to Finland, which was unheard of uh, before. The eastern part of the country, the poorest part of the country, started to receive a lot of Russian, very wealthy Russian, uh, Russians coming into the country, uh, staying at the hotels, spending money at the restaurants, buying second, uh, second houses, homes in, in, in Finland, bringing a lot of money in, uh, paying taxes in, in many cases in, in Finland. So also the image of Russia started to change from being threatening or challenging uh, to something beneficial because people started to really feel the impact of that. Uh, the interaction really boosted the economic development of the border area, 
and hence the whole uh, attitudes, the historical attitudes, which, to be mildly, to be to be mild, used to be very negative, started to change uh, slowly. Uh, a small illustration here. This is a simple graph uh, that shows you the number of border crossings at the border, uh, which I take as an indication of the the, the openness and, and intensity of cross-border linkages. So we start from the era when the Soviet Union collapsed, from the from the point that the border used to be closed. The the number of crossings very very slow, uh, very small. In uh, 1989, the number of border crossings were around 800,000 on the entire border in, in a year, right? Close to 90% of that those were made by Finns. From there, this is the moment when the border started to open uh, and a lot more effort were being put on the various cross-border policies, the, uh, especially after, after 2000 and 2010. The future vision was very optimistic that this is going well, we are interacting more, both sides of the border are benefiting from this interaction, even though we still don't see and think alike, the border openness is a very good thing. It, it creates investments, it creates capital. Uh, let's push this further. 2013, there was a, an estimation that by 2018, the number of border crossings would be already more than 20 million. And based on this estimation, number of major infrastructure investments and projects were put in place on the border area. New border crossing points, major shopping centers, big hotel complexes, way out of scope uh, of the Finnish population, but really requiring uh, a lot of uh, capital and, and people coming from the Russian side. So what happened right after this estimation was made was something like this. The, the estimation is the line pointing up and the actual border crossings are the, is the line uh, going down. So you can see that the future vision, the very optimistic future vision, did not really materialize. And all those investments that were base, made based on the, the figures of 20 million people turn out to be a rather bad investment, if we would like that. So what happened here would be the question. Crimea happened there, the, the Russian invasion of, of Crimea. Uh, and, and of course, even though it's quite separate from Finland, it really changed the mentality, and, and also slowly then the policies of Finland, uh, because we had had this understanding that we have a, this cross-border cooperation that had been flourishing for the last 30 years, had made it so connected that even though we don't think alike, we share the same understanding how things work. We have a same understanding of security and what needs to be done to enforce that. But the events in Crimea really were a, a watershed moment in the sense that a lot of people in Finland felt if Russia can do that to another neighboring country, Ukraine, what would prevent Russia acting the same way against Finland? Here we can see, of course, uh, uh, the numbers went down, started to go a little bit, and this, of course, is the, the COVID pandemic. So this has nothing really to do with the Finnish Russian policies as such. This is, the, this is the pandemic when the border was very much closed. I think we could find similar graphs about most borders, so let's not look into that too much. Uh, here, uh, then again, the border uh, crossing started to actually increase when the pandemic restrictions were lifted, and even though the war uh, had already started uh, February uh, 22. We can talk about that uh, uh, more as well. Right now, we are pretty much at the same level than at the, uh, during the era when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. So far this year, 2023, there has been approximately, uh, uh, well, less than a million, around 900 uh, crossings. But as mentioned in the beginning of this talk, uh, tomorrow the border crossing points, most of them will be closed completely. Um, so again, I talked before I sent this slide. 
the watershed moment 2014, I took a very good illustration, in, in my mind, a good illustration uh, of the mentality. This is from a demonstration that took place in Finland in 2014, following the events in, in Crimea. And this young lady here holds a sign saying, Crimea, today, Finland, next. Uh, of course, you most likely recognize the gentleman here. Uh, map of Finland painted with the, the Russian colors and stop Putler. Uh, most likely you get what, uh, what's the reference uh, there might be. But anyways, the, the important point is, is really here. So the, the, most of the agreements and the whole mentality that surrounded the relations were very much based on the so-called Helsinki principles from 1975, when the OSCE meeting took place in Helsinki. Uh, long story short, three important principles, which were really a cornerstone of the European security uh, in environment, and then broadly as well, but let's focus on Europe now. Refraining from the threat or, or use of force, respect for the territorial integrity of states, and inviolability of borders. And by the actions in Crimea, it was felt that Russia had violated all of these three things at once. So the contractual base, uh, which had been very fundamental for this openness of the border, became uh, questioned, if not nullified, very quickly. The way how Russia defined or started to define its security was actually very threatening now for the neighbors. There was no longer a coherent, consistent understanding what security uh, would mean. Now we finally get to what has been going, going, going on and, and that I wanted to talk about, but I think this more historic account was uh, very important in here. Um, so the relations had been deteriorating already since 2014. It's important to, to to remember that, even though the start of the war to, in February 2022 was certainly a, a game changer, complete game changer. But many things had already uh, decreased into a very poor situation uh, before that. But important here was that, of course, the war was completely condemned uh, very quickly after it started, but it also led to the the NATO application by Finland, which had been a topic on the agenda since the collapse of the Soviet Union for the last 30 years, uh, but never uh, the decision or even a, a, a serious discussion about that had been made. The NATO discussion was, in my view, never really been, uh, had been about NATO itself, but whether or not somebody considered Russia as a concrete military threat or not. If one did, then they most likely were uh, uh, supporting NATO membership. If you did not consider Russia as a concrete military threat, you would say, why, why join a, a military alliance uh, that would only send a, a negative message to the Russian side? And what that negative message is, uh, was that if we join NATO, we are going to lose more than we would gain. All those economic linkages would most likely be cut. Uh, Finland was benefiting, as I explained, very highly on these economic relations. A lot of people felt like if in this moment, for example, 2013, when the trade was booming and the cross-border cooperation was really fr flourishing, had we joined NATO then, we would uh, have lost all those economic benefits. And that's why, at least in my reading, a lot of people were hesitant to, to make that move. By this time, all those relations had already deteriorated to the point that people felt like, okay, there's nothing really to lose anymore. This is the time to make the move and, <clears throat> and join the NATO. The application was put in in May 2022, two and a half months, less than two and a half months after the war, uh, which I think is one of the fastest application process ever. Uh, and even though Turkey and Hungary took their time to, to accept that, it still became the fastest ever uh, membership process 
during the history of the whole uh, alliance. Uh, <clears throat> what it did, and what we see today uh, at the border, it really uh, ended what was left on these bilateral relations. And what we see today is, uh, can be seen as a Russian retaliation to that uh, addition. What I mean, what's happening today, uh, it has become quite clear that the Russian authorities are assisting uh, refugees, third country refugees, uh, providing them uh, rides to the Finnish border and uh, trying to create pressure uh, on that border uh, as a means of a hybrid uh, warfare. So, a game changer, I took two pictures. Uh, this is very much, to me, a one illustration that, that really depicts how the relations used to be between Finland and Russia, very pragmatic. Uh, if you don't know, again, most likely you recognize the gentleman here, uh, Mr. Putin. This is our sitting president, Saul Niinistö. They used to play hockey uh, together. Uh, as a, well, they both like hockey, but I think it was a more of a publicity stunt to show the people that we have a very pragmatic relations, that you know, we, can, we can talk, we can play hockey, we, we know each other. Uh, so, it doesn't matter what's happening at the highest political level or geopolitics, what happens between Russia and the US, for example. We don't need to take part in that. We have these very close pragmatic relations. Uh, President Niinistö often used to call uh, President Putin uh, privately and discuss uh, various things. And this was always being uh, put forward as a, as a very diplomatic way of handling difficult relations. Even that, basically to say that, uh, convince the, the people as well, that it doesn't matter what happens uh, at the highest political level. Even though Russia might be acting quite aggressively in the world stage now, we have a president who can call on his phone and you know, they, will, they will figure it out somehow. These kind of uh, direct linkages were valued very, very highly. Of course, then the war started, and President uh, Niinistö uh, made the following statement in his long speech, which is available online, and I recommend you to read it because whoever wrote that uh, should get a raise. Uh, a famous sentence that started to circulate, at least in the international media the mask has now come off, and only the cold face of war is, is visible, indicating that, that these, these former relations have been completely uh, vanished by now, and we are back into a very realist way of handling relations. Now, what happened after that, even though we were focusing on what's happening in Ukraine and between Russia and Ukraine, much of the Finnish media started to depict uh, illustrations like this. So this is the Finnish border. Quite often they showed uh, what's the uh, what's happening at the various military bases on the, on the Russian side. They were showing uh, satellite pictures, in often cases uh, in the online media, these sliding pictures where you can see before and after uh, in order to indicate that how many planes have been added uh, to the Air Force bases on the Russian side, how many new tanks can we see on the other side. Uh, in this case, how many new trenches have been duck on the Russian side, feeding this idea that, that, uh, that perhaps Russia is also preparing to, to do something with, with Finland uh, as well. Why I talk about this is that a very strong argument was put forward, and this is from our border guard, that the security environment has changed so much that we need to react regarding the actual border. Uh, and, and border enforcement. And it led to the construction of this quite debated uh, border, border fence, uh, which was also in the, in the opening slide as it is uh, now. This is when it, they started to build it. Uh, and of course, the tricky part here is that you know, the fences come in, in many shapes and, and forms. But if really the security situation is this, that if we are really under the perception that Russia might provide a concrete military threat to Finland. 
if we are really depicting security in military terms, that there might be Russian tanks or, or planes trying to cross the border, then at least in my mind, uh, the provided solution didn't really match the, the perception of the threat. If we are really uh, thinking that Russian tank might come across the border, I think it's rather useless to build this, this fence. Uh, but the, the military threat, these images, resonated really well with much of the population, especially the older ones who had gone through the war, who had seen the Russian tanks coming across the border. And that created a, a momentum to uh, accept and approve this decision, which year before that had been openly ridiculed in Finland, even among the, the policymakers. Like, why, we, don't, we don't need that. You know, we, we handle relations differently. This is a very American thing to do. To, uh, to, to build a, a wall along the border. Uh, and Mr. Trump was openly ridiculed in the Finnish media and, and even policy debates that we don't, we don't do that. I mean, we, we understand better. Uh, but then the war started and a couple of days later, we started to build the wall uh, on the border. Now, this is the first image that became to, to public. You can see here, this was the, 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 the formal, um, what's the word? when you create this, this computer model to show what you are planning. So this is not a real uh, image. You probably can, can see that. Uh, and of course, then the first fence, when it came like this, it, uh, I made some statements in the media. You can read them. They are in, in English. Read Financial Times, for example, to say that uh, it looks like a, like a joke, uh, basically. And now it looks more, more serious, but my first reaction was that, OK, Again, if no matter what the threat perception is, if we are talking about the Russian tank, or even if we are talking about Russia using migrants as a as a weapon, in, in a in a in a way, I don't think they are going to, to to stop here. I mean, I would climb over that pretty pretty quickly. But then again, it has now been enforced, so I have to say that that this is not the full the full picture. But I'm showing you this. And if you compare this, this is, uh, this is the border fence. This is my, my uh, kid's football field. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to make an open joke about that, but there is some uh, truth behind that. The defense element is exactly the same. You, you can buy it. You and me are, can go to the hardware store in Finland and buy that. It's 28 uh, euros per meter. Uh, so the, the criticism was, at least in my part, was not really about defense or whether or not we need that, but if we need to spend $400 million to, 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 to build this. But then again, it's, it's now uh, happening uh, right there. They, they made it uh, higher and added a, a barbed wire there. So now it's starting to look a bit more serious. But still, I challenge the fact that if we are preparing for a military threat, it is rather useless. Apart from the fence, uh, the relations have really gone down. Uh, we are at the lowest point, uh, basically, ever, and I don't see a very optimistic future from this point either. But it's, it is uh, almost sad to think about it, how long an active process was used to try to normalize the relations, to get rid of the Cold War era rhetoric, invest millions and millions and millions of taxpayers' money to, to, to get rid of the, the sharp border and, and the very hostile relations. But this is where we are now. So all forms of cross-border cooperation uh, has been halted, come to an end. The only authority that is collaborating is, ironically, the border guard. They, they are still collaborating uh, to an extent, uh, the Finnish and Russian border guard. They used to do that even uh, during the Cold War time, the Finnish and Soviet uh, border guards. There has been always quite interesting pragmatic collaboration between them as, as well. Okay, defense, I mentioned that already. Uh, the connections, to, of course flights, but also the train connection and why I mentioned this here is not simply that the one train was cancelled, that's not the point, but the process of creating this fast train between Helsinki and St. Petersburg was a big symbolic moment during this open era. Uh, it was 
a concrete manifestation of the fact that uh, how good the relations had gone. And it was very pragmatic because the train did not stop at the border. All the formalities were done when the train was moving. So the travel time from Helsinki to St. Petersburg reduced to just over three hours. Whereas before, when you took a bus, this bus could be at the border maybe two hours, maybe seven hours, and you had to wait and sit there. So the train was very handy uh, and, and, and really crystallized uh, the, the relations. So when that was uh, cancelled, it also was taken as a symbolic moment that that open era had come to an end and the interaction <coughs> had, uh, had to be stopped. In July 2022, this new uh, Border Guard Act came to enforce. That's the one that the government is uh, now putting in place today, the Article 16, that the border can be closed in, in serious situations. It also uh, allows the, the government to build defense on private land without uh, the authorization of the landowner. Most of the land in Finland is privately owned, so it's being built on, on the private land. So the government can, can proceed with defense construction whether or not the respective owner of the land agrees to that, even though most of them do. I have to say that most of them do agree uh, to that. All the uh, visas have been terminated. No more visas are issued. Crossing the border with any kind of vehicle at the moment with Russian register plates uh, is not allowed. First, uh, first the, the trailers and, and, and semi-trailers were uh, completely banned and now also individual uh, uh, vehicles. The natural gas pipeline contract, even though it had not been used for more than a year, but now finally in uh, in May 2023, the whole contract was uh, terminated. The fence pilot has now been finished. There are six kilometers of that at the moment. They will build 250 kilometers more. Soon after that, the Finnish embassy in Moscow started to receive these envelopes with uh, some kind of a white powder, which created a, a bit of a, a chaos. The following week, the Russian government froze the bank accounts of the Finnish representations uh, in Finland, the, the embassy in Moscow and the consulate in St. Petersburg. Very soon after that, later the same month, the operation li license of the Finnish consulate in Murmansk at the very north and Petrosavorsk in the east were terminated. Two days after that, I believe, or, or three days after that, Finland expelled nine Russian diplomats uh, on suspicion of espionage. A couple of days after that, surprisingly, uh, Russia uh, responded by, by uh, expelling, I believe, seven uh, Finnish uh, diplomats. Uh, the consulate, the major consulate in St. Petersburg, where the illustration uh, was here, the Finnish flag was taken down and, and signs of the wall was closed down. Why this is important was that the Finnish embassy, uh, I'm sorry, consulate in St. Petersburg is what used to be the biggest consulate, uh, the EU consulate on, on the Russian side and issuing most the EU and Schengen visas. So not just the Finnish visas, but Schengen uh, visas. So coming uh, from Russia to, to Europe in general became a lot more <coughs> difficult. Just a month ago, October 8th, I don't know if they made the news here, but the, the gas pipeline and also the data cable between Finland and Estonia became, uh, became fractured. It uh, had now become clear that a Chinese vessel with the Russian crew, though, uh, that had left from uh, Kaliningrad, Russia had dragged an anchor, thank you, <laughs> difficult word, uh, uh, had dragged an anchor on, on top of that and actually lost the anchor. So the anchor was left in the seabed and now it was lifted and the, the, the vessel uh, that it belonged to had been, has now been indicated. But again, individual example of uh, retaliation.
Uh, later in October, formally, Russia terminated the governmental agreement, which had been the base uh, on top of which many of these uh, cross-border projects had been built. So there's no any more uh, uh, any kind of agreement guiding the relations between uh, Finland and, and Russia. Earlier this month, uh, Russia reported that they consider the Finnish radio and online networks operating in the border region as a Western propaganda and indicated that they are developing mechanism to stop all the radio and online traffic uh, across the border. Uh, let's see how, how that goes. And now we are here since November 2013. We have this uh, a bit of an issue at the border whereby the Russian government has been pushing uh, migrants to the border, again, in order to create uh, a bit of uh, anxiety on the Finnish side. And apparently, I have to say, doing quite well, because uh, the Finnish side seems to be panicking over, over less than 100 people. Of course, predicting is the future is a difficult thing. Uh, I find that the reactions have been a bit, little bit <clears throat> out of scale uh, at the moment. Uh, just a, a, a couple of articles about this, what happened yesterday and, and day before that. I'm just going to, okay, <laughs> I forgot that I had this here because I've been telling you the story from the Finnish side here, right? So just to, to bring more balance on this, this is a, a Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. You probably recognize him, uh, happy as always on the, on the, on the picture. Uh, and his statement from uh, June, this year, so a couple of months ago. And of course, the Russian perspective on, on why the relations have come to this low point is, is quite different. He argued that our ties did not severe on their own. It was Finland that broke off these ties through its government, who promptly disregarded the long-standing traditions of neighborliness and mutually beneficial cooperation. Right? Uh, and joined the most eloquent and enthusiastic participants in the campaign against Russia, referring to NATO, that because of NATO, now the relations had been uh, deteriorated. It was not us. So very different uh, story. I show you a little bit of a, uh, a packing uh, in terms of statistics on the story that I've tried to, tried to tell you, and I will then close uh, uh, with this. This is a, shows a bit of a trend from 2004 until uh, 2022. I don't have the numbers from this year yet, but you can, you can see how the, the attitudes, well, the statement is, even though Russia has its own problems, Finns have no reason to take negative attitude to this big neighbor. Uh, that used to be a very prevalent uh, logic here, that even though we could see that Russia had become increasingly assertive and aggressive in the global stage, we had these close pragmatic relations that we didn't have to worry about that. You know, we can, we can keep the trade relations open. You know, our president can call Russian president if there's an issue. No need to really react uh, on that. But again, from 2014, the perception started to change uh, quite a bit. How is Russia then predicted according to these polls? And these are pretty wide. Uh, uh, wild, wide uh, polls in Finland. Unstable and predictable. A superpower seeking to expand, so beyond its borders, a major military threat. So these were the three main descriptions on how Finns see Russia. So these are not overly uh, positive if you start to think about your neighbor and, and future prospects in, uh, in this sense. How well the following statements and descriptions reflect one's perception of Russia. Again, unstable and predictable, very strongly. Um, well, dictatorship, superpower, military threat, and, and so on. So not overly positive descriptions. What is then being challenged here? And this one I find quite surprising. Because if you asked in this poll from average Finn, what is Russia actually threatening? The first one is not the, the Finnish security or regional security or your personal uh, well-being, but world peace as a whole uh, and European security. So very broad 
uh, description of what the, uh, what the challenge is. And let me end with this, because this was a very topical discussion. I mentioned already that the discussion about NATO had been there for a long, long time without really changing. Every year it popped up and then you saw the polls and it never really changed. But right, at, right after the war started in, in Ukraine, quite many, quite quickly, changed their attitude. Uh, and, and, and within months the application uh, was put in. So in, in that sense, the war uh, or the invasion of Ukraine, which in intensified the war, was really a watershed moment uh, and heralded the, the very end of this somewhat neutral stance that Finland had tried to maintain uh, for the era following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Laine. It was a pleasure listening to um, that um, very um, timely issue. As you said, you've been giving interviews all night, as I heard. So, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, the, um, the instrumentalization of migrants is definitely something that we will be seeing more and more, I think. Um, this is uh, to conclude the, um, the conference for the online uh, audience. Thank you very much for attending. We're looking forward to meeting you next time. I think we've got other events uh, coming up, so please check out our newsletter and the website. Merci à tous, on vous souhaite une bonne soirée.